And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it really is a, a pleasure to be here. I've always found this particular meeting exceedingly stimulating for one very simple reason. And that's interacting with you, talking with you about your interests and so on. And being in a university, um, one constantly has access to young people, new ideas, new thoughts, new interactions. And what is particularly good about this meeting is the international nature of it. Now what I'm going to talk about is a very international problem. Because in today's world, an infectious agent that arises in Africa, Europe or China is of course shared throughout the world's population. Now what I want to do is sort of go through a little bit of history first. I want to start with the individual who probably contributed more to our understanding of the biological world, namely Darwin, Charles Darwin, and his thoughts about evolution and particular infectious diseases. And then I want to comment a little bit about our own evolution, because often this is quite widely poorly understood in terms of how old our species is, how many generations we've had on this earth, and how have we acquired the various infections that afflict us today. And then I'm going to turn to our society, which is very much in the context of this conference and global issues, and think over the past four or five decades, how has our world changed and how does that influence many facets of modern life? And then specifically to turn to infectious diseases. And then I'm going to talk through a series of examples, the recent pandemics that have afflicted us from the very, very serious, such as HIV, AIDS, to some of the less serious, but equally alarming when they started, the influenza pandemic that we had recently in 2009. So, let's start with evolution. This gentleman, for those who are contemplating studying biology or medicine, or indeed even for those who are going to go into the physical or engineering sciences. This little book, The Origin of Species, which changed the way we think about how living organisms occupy and change our world, this book is an absolute gem full of wonderful statements. Also, the Royal Society in London holds some of the original correspondence that Charles Darwin had. He corresponded with many scientists throughout the world, and in those days, of course, it was by letter. And these letters often took a long time by ship to get from one country to another. Uh, but Imperial College had a gentleman, Huxley, who was a very strong supporter of Charles Darwin, whose views about evolution contradicted popular wisdom, particularly in the church, about the evolution of man. And in essence, this correspondence, I plucked one letter out, which is Charles Darwin drew a little tree, which was the relatedness between different organisms of a particular group. And I'm going to come back to these trees because modern biology and medicine uses these trees to understand evolution in a very detailed way. So we can pluck an organism out of China and we can compare it with an organism in London by looking at its four genetic sequence and then say how closely they are related. And it's quite intriguing in this correspondence with Charles Darwin that he already thought of this as a way of portraying relatedness. The one sentence or paragraph that I find most revealing is this one highlighted in blue. This is in this book, published in 1859. And it's the sentence that starts, we have seen that man by selection can certainly produce great results. And here he was referring largely to agriculture the selection of crop varieties to improve yields, which have become part of the agricultural landscape in Europe and many other regions of the world. In fact, the earliest breeding experiments were probably done in China in terms of rice varieties. But he then comments and introduces the idea of natural selection, and he says, but natural selection, as we shall hereafter see, is a power incessantly ready for action and is as immeasurably superior to man's feeble efforts as the works of nature are to those of art. Now clearly my artistic friends might debate that latter sentence, but you only have to look at the living world, to the diversity of species, to see how natural selection and evolution have shaped 
a huge diversity of living organisms. Now, Darwin had a correspondence at the beginning of our modern understanding of infectious agents by a German scientist, Koch, who established a set of principles and used the beginnings of microscopy, that's looking down a microscope to see very small organisms, to see what were the etiological agents or the causes of disease in humans. And there was a set of discussions going on at the time where Koch had discovered the organism, which was a bacteria, that caused a very important human disease, anthrax. And this was a correspondence uh, between Darwin and the Dr. Sanderson, who did introduce these results to Charles Darwin. And it's very interesting that he was so excited by the identification here, and yet his thoughts about evolution, as I'm going to try and demonstrate to you, are so vitally important in infectious disease work. And the reason for that is very simply that infectious diseases are not a constant entity. These organisms are constantly changing by natural selection and evolution. <coughs> now, what are the infectious agents that we commonly have to address in the world? They range from the very small, such as a virus, which has a genome, which is its genetic code, which perhaps has a, a few tens of thousands of bits of information. And then they go through large things like worms that live in the gut, parasitic worms, and these have genomes of many, many millions of bits of information. And then we have the bacteria, which are probably one of the most successful species on Earth, who live in all environments, both inside our cells, but in the free living environment, the Earth, and the soil, and so forth. And they have a most extraordinary set of life cycles, where they're able to exchange genetic material with each other in a very prolificous way, actually. Um, they can share their genomes with other organisms. And this is very important to us today because, for example, if you're taking an antibiotic to cure a gut infection, then the target of that antibiotic, say it's salmonella, can exchange its genetic information with other constituents of your gut, the flora that's there, and if drug resistance evolves, then a memory of the genes for that drug resistance can be stored in other bacteria within the gut. So this, the bacteria are very, very important organisms to us. And then secondly, I put the viruses similarly are rather important. And in the history of medicine, it is only relatively recently, since the 1970s and 80s, that we've begun to develop drugs to tackle viral infections um, and indeed, in the 1980s, dominantly, the vaccines that protect the children of today. But I'll turn to these in detail. Now, I just wanted in passing to mention that in the West, the rich developed, highly sophisticated medical and scientific world, um, and increasingly, of course, in China and India and Southeast Asia, then, in essence, we tend to think of the common infections that afflict us in the poorer regions of the world, and probably in 70% of the world's population, there's a set of parasitic infections, or tropical diseases, that are largely ignored. And they're now called the neglected tropical diseases, and these are some of them. Trypanosomiasis, which is sleeping sickness, for example. And the bacterial infections, leprosy, which causes the degeneration of limbs. And then in the helmet infection, schistomiasis is bilharzia very serious disease you contract from bathing in water. And then the viruses, the fastest growing infection in the world today is the dengue virus. It is spreading very systematically out of the tropical regions. And so, for example, if you look at the bottom end of the United States, Texas in particular, and Florida also, you find dengue has suddenly become a very, very important viral infection. Now, where have we got our infectious agents from? Well, it won't surprise you to learn that we've got most of them from our ancestors in our evolutionary history. That's the species that precede Homo sapiens, sapiens, that's us. We've also acquired an awful lot from live wildlife, and I'll give some examples in a minute, of two very important infections. 
And increasingly, in today's world, we acquire a lot from livestock. That's the proximity of our relationship with cattle, sheep, chickens, and ducks. We acquire a lot of infections from them. Now, undoubtedly, we send infections back to them. But remember, they don't have a reporting system, so we never really know about these. Although, with modern genetic techniques, and I've given one example on the right, Staphylococcus, which is a bacterium, so undoubtedly we passed some of these particular strains back to animals where they established as a serious disease. So this is a two-way flow between humans and livestock and pets and wild animals. Now turn to our own evolution. Constantly in the news and the press as another hominid species is discovered, a new one in Africa related to Lucy, who was discovered in Ethiopia, which was the very beginnings of upright walking of our species. We are ourselves, though, a very recent entry onto the Earth. So Homo sapiens sapiens is a few hundred thousand years old, perhaps 200,000. Now, generation time in biology is a very important concept. It's the average time from your birth to when, if you're a female, you give birth to a female child. And that is the generation replication rate of the species. And for humans, that time is roughly 20 to 30 years. It has changed during the epochs. And so in our existence on this earth, we've only had a few thousand generations. So we're a very, very novel species. Now if I throw it back to you and say, if I take HIV as a virus, how many in the same time period that we've been on this earth how many generations would they have had the virus? Or influenza virus? Anybody want to hazard a guess? We've had a few thousands, perhaps tens of thousands. How many has a virus had in the same time period? Nobody wants to hazard a guess? <coughs> yes? Not bad, many, many trillions. So in essence, you're on the right ball court, just a few noughts missing, but in a sense, that illustrates a very important point. It illustrates that our evolution is very, very recent, our rate of change is very slow, while infectious agents have had trillions of generations often, and their ability to adapt and change is on a much faster time scale than our own. Now let's have a look at our modern world and think about what's important in it. The first thing is demography, that's human population growth, and this graph is really quite frightening. If you look at the bottom, 1950, the world's population was about 2.5 billion, and now something like 60 to 70 years later, our population has just crossed 7 billion. And that says it all. Our problems of resources, of energy, and indeed of health, which I'll come to, are very much related to this continually growing population. If I look at this as the moderate projection going forward to 2050, then they were up near this 9 billion point, which is indeed a very frightening prospect in terms of water, land for production of food, and indeed the obvious problem, which you'll be hearing about, which is global warming in terms of the production of using certain energy sources, CO2, which provides this mantle, which keeps the heat on the earth. Demography is important for infectious disease agents for two reasons. One, and this is well understood in the literature, the denser the population, the more likely an organism is to transmit a unit of time. But second, and much, much more importantly, every transmission event is an opportunity for evolution, for change. And therefore, the bigger the population, the faster the spread, the faster the rate of evolution of the organism. The second facet of modern life is illustrated here. On the left, and this is taken from 2009, although the database exists in Los Alamos in the States, each yellow dot is an aeroplane. This is a 24-hour clock moving across the world, and it shows Europe. We're in daytime in Europe in the morning, and you can see this intense activity of flights. 
As we move to daytime in the States, you can see intense activity on the east and west coast. The most dramatic change in the past four decades has been in China and Southeast Asia. It's the huge, huge growth in flight and travel. Now this database is very sophisticated. I'm only giving you a glimpse of it. There are records for the number of passengers on each of these planes, how many stopovers they've made, where they started their journey, and so forth. And so this gives a picture of how humans move around the world. And the connectedness is summarized on the right, and the white lines are highly connected, and that's east and west coast of America, and then a very strong connectance from the east coast to London in Europe, and then growing connectance over in China um, and Japan, linking bits of Asia. And this, if you go back in the time series of this database in Los Alamos, and you go back 50 years, the picture was hardly populated 50 years ago. Now, to summarize that effect on humans, the best way, um, well, first of all, I should stress that it's a very important facet of infectious disease spread. This was the 2009-10 influenza epidemic that caused such concern. It started in rural Mexico, it went to Mexico City, and then it moved rapidly from there to a series of cities at the top graph in the United States. And then for the United States, by air movement, it jumped to Europe, to Southeast Asia, down to Australia. And then the connectance after that was very substantial. This work was done by genetic analysis, which was you take an isolate of the virus, you sequence the information stream, and you compare it with an isolate taken in another part of the world, and by various algorithms, you can say that this organism was related to that organism, but it occurred after that organism. And slowly, you can build up a linkage pattern of how the infection spread. And this influenza epidemic, in the space of a few months, or in fact, the space of a few weeks was spread from Mexico City, became, from a local problem, to a completely global problem, and that is air travel. And if we summarize our species, this is a slide taken from a ge geographer and a geographical journal by Bradley, and it shows four generations of the same family in England. The grandfather, great-grandfather rather, lived on the east coast of England, and he moved between villages and towns, probably by walking, perhaps by coach or horse. And if you take his son, the grandfather, he moved between counties by coach and horse. If you take his son, the father, he was influenced a little bit by the Second World War in his travel, but he also started to become a tourist. And he moved between countries. And then his son, on the right-hand bottom, is all of you. You are total globetrotters in your lifespan. And therefore, as a species that has only had a few thousand to tens of thousands of generations, we've turned from an isolated local species. Within four generations, we've become a global trotter. We, certain, we travel the world within time spans of 24 hours. And this means that an infectious agent that typically might arise locally, then perhaps die out, now spreads globally very, very quickly. And that's a hugely difficult problem to confront. The other aspect is a change in our lifestyle. We are becoming, at the moment, this may change in the future, for reasons that probably will be obvious to you. Uh, Mega City is a city over 10 million. And you can see on the graph or the table on the bottom, but the megacity growth has been dominantly in Asia and is predicted to continue to be so. China is a good example, population of 1.2 billion, a number of very, very large cities. The biggest concentration in the world is down the bottom, is the Pearl River Delta in China, which is Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and uh, Guangzhou. And that is a population of 120 million in a totally connected zone. Now, the opportunities of the evolution of infectious agents are these areas, they are going to evolve in these areas, because this is where all the transmission occurs. And also, it is where, to feed these populations, you have to draw in livestock, such as chickens, 
in close proximity with the urban centres to feed the growing population. So you provide this interface for the evolution and transmission of novel agents. And I'll come back to some real examples of that in a minute. So these megacities are a deep problem. Now the reason I said this may change, of course, the World Wide Web, very fast transmission um, speeds, may, question mark, mean that we've become less urban in the future, we become more home or village or town orientated because we can communicate with our fellow human beings via very sophisticated technology. I saw an example of this recently, a company that I'm associated with and sit on the board has a huge multinational connectance and in a sense we spend a huge amount of money in travelling and moving people around and we started to experiment with some very sophisticated video connecting systems, some of them which give three-dimensional imaging of groups of people in a room, and it's almost like, although you're on a, uh, uh, an internet connection, it's almost like being with the people in that other room. So it may be in the future that this pattern of urbanization changes. Livestock, there are a lot of surprises in the livestock distribution. If I said to you, what is the country in the world that has the highest density of chickens per person per square meter in the world, what would you say? There's a hint in this slide, obviously, but its grain is not fine enough. Anybody like to guess? If I said ducks per square meter per person, where would you say? Parts of China, certainly. Um, if I say chickens per square meter per person, it is the Netherlands in Europe. Which is a, a deep surprise. They produce a lot of battery farm chickens. And evolution of drug resistant bacteria is a deep problem in the Netherlands because of this chicken producing industry. So there are many surprises in these distributions, but it's very important to understand them. Now let's think of some recent examples which illustrate some of the problems. I'm going to start with something you probably haven't heard about, but was in the news this week, simply because there have been 10 deaths recently, literally in the last few weeks, in the southern states from this virus, um, due to the virus invading the central nervous system and causing encephalitis. But it's a virus that emerged, um, it comes from birds, it's transmitted by a mosquito, and it was one of these jumps from wildlife to humans, and it occurred in the United States, and probably somewhere around the 1990s, the beginning, and then from the 1990s up to the present, it now covers the whole of the United States. So there's a recent emergence of a vector-transmitted virus which causes mortality, of which we have no effective drug or vaccine at the moment, which has become from nothing in the space of essentially two decades a very important infection. The bigger ones, though, are these. Some of you may remember the SARS epidemic of uh, 2003. Um, I was seconded by the World Health Organization to Beijing during this epidemic, much to the horror of my wife at the time, and uh, she insisted I carried a large case of surgical masks um, to inhibit the virus coming in, and I wore them all the time. Well, I got on the plane, um, I was the only passenger on Air China, going from London to Beijing, and all the stewards and the pilots were wearing masks, so I thought I'd try one of my surgical masks, and of course I couldn't breathe through it, because it was essentially so effective, it, it, if you moved and walked up and down the, the corridor, it was quite a struggle. So I'm afraid I deposited um, the surgical masks in the hands of the stewardesses, and then resorted to an old method, which is wiping your hands with alcohol, which is moderately effective. Anyway, this epidemic took off um, and was solved very quickly, and I'll explain why. And it gave the world a slight sense of complacency, or created a sense of complacency, because governments and the World Health Organization said, well, here we've had the emergence of a very unpleasant infection with a very high case mortality rate, and we've solved it. We've dealt with it. And I'll come back to why we did that. Um, at the beginning, it was thought that the human 
um, virus came from a civet cat, uh, which had been transmitted in the animal markets of Guangdong in China. But in fact, it comes from a bat. The genetic homologies between the human SARS virus, it's a small virus that lives in the gut, um, is most closely related to the species found in bats. So there's another example of wildlife, just as the West Nile virus in the States, wildlife contributing the genetic origins of the disease that emerges in us. Now this is probably HIV's most important infection that we have in the world today. We have very effective drugs, but no effective vaccine. And Beatrice Han, who's a biologist, has spent much of her life working in West Africa on chimpanzees, their behavior, but she was asked at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic to take some blood samples, and these blood samples revealed some very interesting viral infections. And HIV evolved from a chimpanzee virus probably multiple times. How did it evolve? It's not peculiar sex practices. It was certainly the eating of raw chimpanzee meat, bush meat, and inside your mouth, any individual day, you have lots of little minor abrasions in your mouth, and it would be very easy for something to transmit from the blood of the chimpanzee into your blood system.